Praise God. Welcome to church today. How was your week? We are trusting God that the upcoming one will be better than the last one because the psalmist says that the path of the righteous is like the morning sun shining ever brighter to the full light of day. Last Sunday, we continued our teaching series tagged The Honor Code. If you have missed any of the messages in the series, you should check them out on our YouTube page. Today promises to be great as well as we continue the series. There are different means by which you could connect to the service. It is being streamed on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Feel free to connect on the channel that is most convenient for you. We have a service tailored for our teenagers, which holds via Zoom starting at 10 a.m. every Sunday. Kindly encourage your teenagers to connect and be a part of it. You can find the link on our social media handles. We also have small fellowships called Connect Groups. They are virtual location-based groups that meet bi-weekly to share the Word of God and pray together. In case you're joining us for the first time, there is a form right there in the chat window that we would love for you to complete. Please fill it with accurate information. We would like to connect with you to ask how your experience was. Kindly engage using the chat window in the channel where you're connecting from. Also, if you could share the link to this service on your social media handles, we would appreciate it a lot. Let us have a quick word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for today. We ask that you speak to us. The entrance of your word gives light and understanding to the simple. So we ask that there will be an entrance of your word, that there will be light, there will be life, and there will be change. Help us to grow in love, grace, and faith, that nobody will remain the same and that we will continue to make greatness common. In Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Amen. Let us go into a time of praise and worship.
beautiful, most beautiful one. I love that scripture so much. It's a beautiful for all situations. When the Bible says it's beautiful for all situations, I want you to key into it. The situation that I am right now with my business is working out beautiful because God is in it. It's beautiful for situation because it's the most beautiful one. Wanting a desire, only this I seek, just to dwell, dwell, dwell here forever. This will be my passion, laying at your feet, just to dwell, dwell, dwell here forever. His father, closest friend, most beautiful, most beautiful. Yes, you are, dearest father, closest friend, most beautiful. Say one thing I desire, only desire, sing. Just to dwell, just to dwell, dwell, dwell here forever. This will be my pasture. This will be my pasture. Laying out your feet. Laying out your feet. Just to dwell. Just to dwell, dwell. Sing it again, say.
Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's get into the word of God. And uh, I believe that uh, the word of God will profit you today and your life will never be the same again. If you have not been a part of the series that we started a while ago, which is uh, 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 the honor code, the honor code, I want to encourage you to get on our resource page, on our website, you get the, to be able to download the messages there, get on our YouTube channel and you'll be able to get the messages there. Powerful, powerful message brought uh, by my wife last week. It was, it was powerful and I, I wanted to be uh, able to get hold of that, how we honor God with our time. And that was titled A Life of Times and it was such a, a powerful message that I think you should be a part of. Today, I'm speaking on what I titled Kingdom Trustees. As we get on with how we honor God with our lives, uh, especially honoring God with our talent, honoring God with our time, and then also honoring God with our treasure. Glory be to God. So we're getting to this part of this series where we're speaking to the subject of honoring God with our treasure. Honoring God with our treasure. And the title is Kingdom Trustees. Kingdom Trustees. One important paradigm that we must all have is that God wants us to honor him with everything. Everything that we have. Everything. We, we, we're supposed to honor God with who we have and then honor God with what we have. Everything. 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 He wants us to honor God with everything. And especially when you're joined to a ministry like the Elevation Church where God has given us a word for this year. Uh, and that word came from Agai chapter 2 from verse 6 to 9. I want to be able to read that just to remind you of what God told us as we, as we got into the year 2021. Agar 2 and verse number 6 says, For thus says the Lord, the Lord of hosts, once more, it's a little while, I will shake uh, heaven and earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Said the silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. 
the glory of the latter temple shall be greater. That's where we got the word for this year from, greater. He said, the glory of the latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. He said, I will shake everything. And you know there's a shaking going on all around the world right now. A lot of shaking going on. There's a shift going on. The pandemic and the economic downturn, uh, you know, has created an opportunity for wealth redistribution. A lot of opportunities are coming up. Uh, people are migrating and moving from one place to the other, taking up new opportunities and all that. New industries are being born. Some industries are being enhanced. And God is leveraging the situation that has uh, been occasioned in our world by the pandemic to redistribute wealth. And the purpose of the distribution of wealth is for kingdom advancement. And only stewards will qualify to participate in this wealth distribution. And that's why I'm bringing this message to you today. So global wealth redistribution has positioned faithful stewards to honor God with giving for kingdom advancement. Because the purpose of the redistribution going on around the world right now in some part of the world, there's a lot of empowerment going to people of different races. People who have been marginalized before, now being empowered. The voice of the oppressed being heard a little bit more. And in, in, in parts of the world where you have uh, a, a lot of social uh, 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 security going on and all that, people are being catered to, being empowered to be able to do something with their lives, to, not, to go beyond survivor, to, to be able to thrive as we get out of this, this situation. How do you want to be positioned for all that? Do you want to engage the help of God and the favor of God to be able to come out of this season and come into the fullness of what God has in mind for you? Uh, well, you know, living out of, uh, you know, scratching and scraping and just getting by, in, getting into the fullness of God's will for your life. If you're going to be able to do that, then something has to change in your mind. A sense of honor and the appreciation of God's original intention for wealth has to be paramount on your mind. And what I just said right now, that sense of honor to God or honor for God with my resources and a sense of appreciation of all that God is bringing into my life is what engenders a sense or a mindset of stewardship. Of stewardship. Whether you call yourself, I mean, someone a steward or a trustee. For instance, a trustee is defi de de defined as uh, a person or a firm that holds and administers property or asset for the benefit of a third party. And a, uh, a steward is the one that has a mindset that says, I am not the owner, I'm only holding it in trust. So in a season where God wants to redistribute wealth, is looking for people who have a stewardship mindset. The big thing that you should think about right now is that before now, do you have a stewardship mindset or an ownership mindset? You have a stewardship mindset or an ownership mindset. A stewardship mindset will qualify you to step into the fullness of what God has in mind for you. In fact, it will position you for divine help. It will, uh, it will position you for accountability because a steward says, I am not the owner. I'm holding it in trust for the owner and I know I'm going to be held accountable for it. Though it's fully at my disposal, I'm still going to be accountable for it. Though I work for it, and God blessed my work, and resources have been channeled in my direction, but there's one person who is the source of all things, and is, 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 uh, is, is the God of all flesh, Father of all spirit, the one who says in Psalm 24 and verse number 1, the earth is the Lord, and the fullness thereof, and everyone that lives within it. Everything belongs to him. Everything belongs to him. When you have that mindset, uh, there's a shift that happens in your life that positions you to trust God completely and only and honor him with what he has given you and not to have the ownership mindset that says everything that I have belongs to me and 
I can use it as, as I like. Money comes to amplify uh, the mindset of the one who holds, who holds it. Yeah. And when money comes to the hand of a person who does not have a stewardship mindset, what happens is that the person starts to see himself larger than life. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, 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 there are some things that comes with it. I'm going to get into it in a bit. All through the scriptures, Jesus knew that uh, where most believers will struggle will be in the place of financial stewardship. So, he spoke a lot about money and financial stewardship. Out of about 39 or 40 parables of Jesus, uh, uh, 11 or so of them have to, some, one, one thing to do with money or the other. For instance, in the parable of the eating treasure uh, and the pear, he compared the kingdom of heaven to riches. And the way people long for riches, he said that's how we're supposed to be longing for the kingdom of heaven. Uh, 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 and, and in the parable of talent, he tells us the story of a master who entrusts his servant Talents and, uh, you know, uh, and trust the servant with money to make a point about being productive. In the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, it draws our attention uh, to the greater eternal re re reversal where those who seem to fare well in this world may not necessarily fare well in the world to come, especially if they have been consumed by the possession that they have here right now, and that possession has become the God of their life. That will not be your story in the name of Jesus. And as somebody who may even be deprived here, though his will for us is not to be deprived here, uh, but that somebody who, who may have been deprived here or not may even fare better in heaven. May fare better in heaven. Glory be to Jesus. And Jesus had all those different kinds of parables that he said, I mean, that, that he taught his disciples all through the Bible. So why does Jesus care about money so much? Why does he care about money so much? Why, does he, why did he dedicate so much of his words? He spoke more about money than some subject matters that some of us hold so dear. Jesus knew the effect that money can have on his followers and on, on and the power of money. That's why he spoke to us consistently. At the heart of Christianity, this is one reason why Jesus spoke a lot about money, is that at the heart of Christianity lies the premise that God created everything and it ultimately belongs to him. That's at the heart of Christianity. Human beings exist as stewards or trustees uh, or managers of God's resources. They are not the owner. God owns everything. That's at the heart of our faith. And they, when we talk about these resources, a, 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 a large part of it is material resources. We've talked, we've talked about our talents before now, and I mean, our skill that God gives us. We talked about money, but today let's focus. I mean, we talked about time, sorry, but today let's focus on money. Money. So stewardship is not just an aspect of our Christian life. It is the whole, <coughs> all of our Christianity. It is a core course in Jesus' discipleship, uh, 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 you know, curriculum. It was a course that if you fail it, you are failed in, in the entire Christian work. That's why, you know, Jesus will, will, will say in Matthew 6 and 24 that you cannot serve two masters. And I'm going to land on that very soon. He said, you, you cannot serve two masters. Uh, he knew, you see, when Jesus was saying you can't serve two masters, you would think he was talking about God and Satan. It would have been, you know, more straightforward if he just said you, you can't serve God and Satan. No, he said you cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon is the spirit of money. Is, is the God of money or covetousness. The demon of covetousness, that's mammon. And he said, Jesus said, no, you, you can't serve two masters. It means in this world, uh, the temptation to serve money may even be greater. And that temptation taking you away from God may be greater than the temptation to serve the devil. So the devil will always leverage that to sway people's mind from being able to worship God completely with what God has given them. And that will not be your own portion in the precious name of Jesus. Uh, so Jesus uh, uh, took his time 
to school us on how to escape this lust for money and covetousness and all those things. Uh, 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 and it, it helped us to understand that our Christian life is supposed to be focused on, on something greater than seeking God for money. But God wants you and I to be wealthy, to be okay, but that money, that wealth, that resource must not take us away from God. For many of us, the struggle to align ourselves with God uh, or God's will is played out in the realm of finances. That's where we struggle the most. How do I honor God in my financial life? It's always a struggle. It's always a struggle. It is the real battleground. Uh, the great man of God, Martin Luther, once said that there are three conversions necessary. The conversion of the heart, which is salvation. The conversion of the mind, which is mind renewer, that the scripture talks about in Romans 12 and verse 2. That be not conformed to this world. That's after you've been saved. That you can still conform to the world. Think like the world. Understand like the world. And manage your life like somebody who is not saved. And many Christians manage their financial life like somebody who is not saved. They have zero stewardship mindset, complete ownership mindset, just like their unbeliever friend. They don't talk to God about how to spend money, what to put money into, and what not to put money into, what aligns with biblical precepts and principles when it comes to handling money. When money comes to you, you don't think about, so I'm a steward. What should I do with this, and what should I not do with it? What are the basic things I should do with money? Next week, we're going to get into that a lot more. But for today, I'm speaking to that mindset. Martin Luther said there are three conversions necessary. The conversion of heart, the conversion of mind, and then the conversion of the pulse. That's the conversion of my wallet. Many Christians have been converted in their heart so they know God. <laughs> They are still working on the conversion of the mind because the journey of mind renewal is a long journey. But where we struggle a lot more is the conversion of the pulse, according to Martin Luther. Uh, and if you see a Christian whose pulse, whose wallet, whose financial life has been converted, there's a huge difference because the person has become a full disciple, a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Glory be to Jesus. Jesus talked about money because when we truly understand our roles as stewards, money then becomes a tool uh, we can invest into growing God's kingdom. That's what it is. That's what it is. That's what it is. So in the Beatitude, Jesus, one of the things that he spoke to us, so the Sermon on the Mount, one of the things that he spoke to was also money. The Sermon on the Mount. You know, in Matthew chapter 6, from verse 19, I read in New King James Version, it said, Do not store up for yourself treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust does not uh, destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. In other words, Jesus is saying that the, the world system is very fragile. The earthly investment vehicles are fragile. Uh, uh, and that's what we're find, find, finding out recently. When things collapse, and some people were, were, were have been hiding things away from God, refusing to do the will of God with the things that he has given us, we just see all of a sudden, everything is reducing to nothing, you know, uh, today we have high rate of depreciation of asset in different places, different things happening. You know, identity theft, unstable stock market, all kinds of things going on. And when, if that is all that your life depends on, then when those things go up and down, uh, some people will develop high blood pressure because you, 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 you have been managing your financial life not as a steward, but as the owner. And you have been doing things as they occur to you without even being able to say, God told me to do this or I've obeyed the principles of God in the way that I manage my finances. Glory be to Jesus. Uh, uh, this is so important that in Matthew uh, uh, 6 that we read there, 
I think in verse 21 that Jesus eventually will say that, look, uh, it's where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. If you say your heart is in the kingdom of God, your treasure should follow you there. The treasure should follow you there. That's how we know that your heart is with God. That's how we know that your heart is with God. It means your treasure follows your heart uh, to where your heart is. And like I said before, the understanding of the fact that God owns everything is what undergirds uh, uh, a financial, a, 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 a good stewardship life. First Corinthians 4 and verse 7. The Bible says, and what do you have? So how are you different from other people? What makes you different from other people? And what do you have that you did not receive? Say so now, if you have received it, indeed, if you receive it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Everything that comes to a believer in Christ Jesus, we receive. We have received. We are, we, we are believers and receivers. God gives <laughs> and we receive. Our God is the source. Your job is a channel. That it provides your business, a channel that it provides, and then we receive through those channels. So your business brings forth, you get high uh, salary and benefits. God uses that career path to channel things to you. And the Bible says we re- we have received, and we must never behave as if we did not receive. You know me, chapter eight, when you read verse seventeen, it buttresses, buttresses that also. He said, then you say in your heart. Verse 17 of Deuteronomy chapter 8. My power and the might of my hand have, uh, you know, have gained me this world. That's what people say when things start to work for them. And you shall, he said, but you shall remember. You shall remember the Lord, the, the, the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you power to get well. That he may do what? Establish his covenant, which he saw to your fathers as it is this day. God is the giver of all good things. He's the one that empowers us to create wealth or to get wealth. He's the one that does that. And that's why Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, also in New King James Version, it says, Honor the Lord with your possession uh, and with the first fruit of all of your increase. It says, So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. There's a mindset with which we honor God. And then God knows that this person can be trusted with wealth. And he keeps pouring it out. He keeps pouring it out. He knows that you're not just seeking him for what you get. That when this thing gets into your hand, you will not forget God. Many people uh, are living their lives right now in such a way that God is not in the center of their lives again. Kingdom is no longer priority to them. It's just amassing and amassing and amassing wealth. That's the priority. When you say, what is the link between what you have amassed and the one who gave it to you? That like the Bible says here in Jeremy 8 and uh, verse 8, it said, uh, is the one that gives you power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant. The purpose of the wealth is for the establishment of the covenant that he has uh, with us. And part of that covenant, uh, you know, establishing of that covenant will come with uh, our sense of honor and dedication to him. And if we have that sense of honor and dedication to him, what we want to do is to serve him with what he has given unto us. To serve him with what he has given unto us. There's a point a man can get to. That money and material possession becomes your God. You can pay lip service to God, to salvation, but really and truly, you can do anything for money. Really and truly, you are, it's becoming much more difficult for you to, uh, uh, you know, for, for you to be, uh, uh, how do I put it now? Like the Bible says, for you to be rich towards God and for you to freely use money for what it is meant for, the primary purpose for which God gave you the money that he has given you. In the Bible, we we'll see two characters that were seriously challenged they, had, they both had encounters with Jesus that should lead to salvation. But the way they reacted, you see the effect that money and lack of uh, a sense of stewardship can have on people, especially when money has come into their hands. The first person I want to speak about, uh, and then I'm going to uh, you know, also talk about Abraham before I start to wrap up, 
The first person I want to speak about is Zacchaeus. In Luke chapter 19, when you read from verse 1 down to 9, the Bible describes Zacchaeus as a tax collector. Yeah. And Jesus, you know, uh, uh, passed through Jericho. And then Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was in town. The Bible says in verse 2 of Luke chapter 19, he says, Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, and then he climbed uh, 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 the tree because he was of short stature. And then he climbed a tree, verse 4, and ran ahead uh, and climbed a sycamore tree. And Jesus saw him. Verse 5, Jesus came, uh, Jesus, uh, and when Jesus uh, came to the place, the Bible says he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay in your house. Jesus invited himself to Zacchaeus' house because of the effort that Zacchaeus put into trying to see him. So Zacchaeus already had a heart that, you know, shows that he needed God and he needed salvation. So the Bible says, so he made haste and came down. And, uh, uh, but when they saw it, they all complained, uh, saying, okay, verse, uh, go, go, go back to verse 6. Uh, so he made haste and come down and received him, you know, joyfully. You could see joy in his heart towards his, his salvation experience or this salvation that is about to come. But when they saw him, they all complained, saying, he's gone to be a guest to a man who is a sinner. But look at verse 8. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. If I have taken anything from anyone by first accusation, I restore fourfold. And verse 9, that's where I'm going. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because uh, he also is a son of Abraham. I'm talking about Zacchaeus, being a Jew. And this is what Jesus was, uh, this, this, what he said moved Jesus. That this guy can handle the kingdom. He can handle being a disciple. Because with the encounter that he had with Jesus, you could see that he, one of the things that Zacchaeus understood was that you cannot be a follower of Jesus and not be able to handle money and put it where it belongs. You cannot be a follower of Jesus and not be someone who understands the honor code of stewardship. And he said, look, this salvation that I'm engaging you in my house today will touch not just my, my mind, not just my heart, it will touch my wallet also. So I'm going to let go of things that I've gotten fraudulently. And much more than that, uh, I'm going to, you know, focus on being generous and giving out. And Zacchaeus decided on his own, I'm going to give out half of what I have. But if you compare that to the rich young ruler, who also had an encounter with Jesus, Mark chapter 10 from verse 17. Uh, please can you give me Mark chapter 10 and verse 17. The rich young ruler also had an encounter with Jesus. It was a similar encounter. But the end of it was different. And the difference between the two of them was the state of their heart. And that's what I'm speaking to today. One was able to deal with, you know, just... Letting go and being a steward and being accountable. The other one was not. Luke, Mark chapter 10 from verse 17 here. The Bible says, now as he was going out on the road, one came running and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? The same guy, this guy, this rich young ruler, uh, rich guy, young man, was also looking for salvation. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me? Uh, good, no one is good but one. Uh, uh, that is God. You know the commandment. He said, do, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother, and all that. And he answered and said uh, to Jesus, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. Then Jesus looked at him and loved him because he's, he's a good guy. And said to him, one thing you lack, one thing that can stop you, one thing that can stop you, one thing you lack, say, go your way. Sell whatever you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come, take up your cross and follow me. Wow. Look at verse 22, the last verse there. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Jesus said, just to test this man, do you really want to follow me? You want to be a disciple? then you have uh, to demonstrate uh, uh, the fact that money is not ruling over your life, 
that you can decide what to do with money and you can decide to honor God with money, not money ordering you around. Many people are living as slaves of money. Because of money, this guy could not follow through with salvation. Zacchaeus, before Jesus asked him anything about his money, already gave him a plan of how he was going to distribute. This guy was holding everything to his chest. You know, some people, uh, uh, all your salary uh, is not even up to $1,000 a month, you know. Uh, but you hold it to your chest to the point that you can't give God out of it. You can't give the poor out of it. You can't even probably service your family well out of it. Just holding everything to your chest. And people lose out on grace. Lose out on God's plan uh, to resource good stewards much more. And to honor stewardship when we live that way. And that's what happens to this guy. The Bible says he went away sorrowful because he had great possession. In other words, you can flip it around to say he went away sorrowful because great possessions had him. His possession held him back from salvation and from working with Jesus and living his life to follow after Jesus because he came to ask for salvation. The big question today, as we start to, to, to wrap this up, the big question, what do you derive or where do you derive your sense of confidence and security from? Where do you derive it from? Your sense of confidence and security, where do you derive it from? Do you derive it from your bank account, your account balance, or the investment you have in stocks, or your real estate invest? Where do you derive your sense of security from? Because that's the most important thing about stewardship. A steward derives his sense of security from God and his relationship with God, not what he possesses. So, it's easy to let go of material possession because it does not diminish you. You know, we live in a day where Forbes, we always have a list of richest men in the continent, richest men in the world. And some people, their goal in life is to enter Forbes' list. Their goal is not for their name to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Their goal is not to have mansions in heaven and to wear crowns in heaven. Their goal is to just be on Forbes' list to be, you know, uh, the big boy of your city. Somebody wants to be London big boy or, you know, or Toronto big boy or big girl, you know, big girl of Los Angeles and all those kind of things. Different cities in the world. People, even Christians, have lost sight of the fact that we are just sojourners on this place, this planet. Our real home is heaven. God wants us to live well here and, and be rich and be okay and be blessed so that we can bless other people, resource his kingdom, focus on kingdom advancement because where we're going to spend eternity, we must lay up treasure there by being focused on the kingdom of God here right now and focusing on how we bless humanity, not just how we are mass. That's how we honor God. And we show that we trust him and our sense of security and confidence comes from him. As we close today, in Genesis 22, when you read from verse 1, the story of Abraham. Abraham demonstrated the fact that his sense of security and dependency is from God, not from what he possessed, not from what he had. So today, when you sing, Abraham's blessings are mine, <laughs> you need to understand what you're singing. If you want to claim the blessings of Abraham, you have to do the works of Abraham. And in Genesis 22, we saw a serious work of Abraham here. In verse 1, the Bible says, Now it came to pass, after these things, that God tested Abraham and said to him. Literally, what God was testing Abraham here for is, Are you a steward or are you the owner? Where do you derive your sense of security from? Who do you trust? Is it what you have? Or me, the giver of all good things. That's the question for Abraham here. And he said, said to Abraham, Abraham said, here I am, verse 2. Then he said to him, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Look at that. At this point, Abraham did not even know where Ishmael uh, was again because he had let go of Ishmael. The only son, the one he waited for, that he loved. You know, sometimes God may ask for something that you really love. Just to see whether your sense of security and confidence is attached to that thing or is hooked to him. Glory be to Jesus. And God asked Abraham, you know, for Isaac. He said, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as bond offering. It means he was going to kill him and then set him on fire. And I'm sure Abraham must have been thinking, God, is this not wickedness? 
That's how I feel sometimes when God says, do something that is not going to be easy, just for you to demonstrate the fact that your sense of confidence and security is on me, not on what you possess. Not on what you possess. When God asks you uh, to leave a place, uh, to stop struggling for something, to stop fighting because of something, or to give a material possession out, when God, uh, when you encounter the word of God and you know you have to be a titan, for instance, you honor God with a percentage of your income to support the preaching of the gospel and your local assembly, how do you react to that? Sometimes, for some people, that's their Isaac, but that's a lower level Isaac. Because some people have gone through Isaac where God is demanding for everything, not just 10%. And some people are still at that level where to let go of 10% is a serious struggle. They have arguments about whether it's Old Testament or New Testament and all that. How do you do the work of Abraham if 10% is still an argument to you? Forget about whether the Old Testament or New Testament. The mind with which you are doing it is what matters. In the same Ten Commandments, the Bible says you shall not murder. You shall not, you know, convert your neighbor's property and all that. Do you say whether it's Old Testament or New Testament? You just don't do those things. In the same vein, Giving to God is never an issue of Old Testament or New Testament. It's about how you and I want to honor God. I'm going to speak to that more in this series as we go into, uh, you know, maybe next week or something. But I need you to understand that where is your sense of security? Abraham here took a three-day journey, verse 3, with prompt obedience. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac, his son, and he split the wood uh, for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham, you know, this thing is not going to be easy. If it was somebody else, if you can't locate, God said you should transfer uh, or do something for or your church or for somebody or, or for a family member or for somebody who needs something. And just because you cannot locate the person's account number, you let go of it, you forgot about it. You told yourself, you, you are better off spending the money on something else. It's your sense of dependency on God. Abraham journeyed three days before he could locate the particular mountain. But he stayed at it. Three days journey. And then on the third day, the Bible says he lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to the young man, Stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. What God demanded of him, he called it worship. Worship. What is your perspective when you give to God? What's your perspective when you give to the poor? What is your perspective when you sponsor the gospel? Is it a donation or worship? Because you are giving it to honor God. It's not a donation. It's your worship. When you give a tithe, it's not a donation. You're not giving to the pastor. You're worshiping God. That's why you should go to a place where you know that they can account for your giving. So you don't have any excuse for not honoring God. As long as you're a believer. Because a part of your resource must honor God, must go to God, must go to God, must go to God. Abraham here said, we're going to worship God. And Abraham took the wood. The Bible says in verse 6 there, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire on his hand and a knife. <laughs> and the two of them went together. And Isaac asked him a funny question. Yeah. Isaac asked him a funny question. Uh, this is the kind of question that your flesh always will ask you when you are about to honor God with your substance. Isaac asked him a funny question. My father, he said, here am I, uh, my son. Then he said, look, th this is the fire and the wood. Where is the lamb <laughs> for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered him in a very beautiful way. My son, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So the two of them went together. He didn't want to tell him, you are the burnt offering. You are the lamb. But when they got there, the Bible did not record it. But Isaac must have struggled a bit, but he tied his hand, tied his leg. There's some, there are things that God will be demanding of you this season to tie up and give to him and bring to him. What will be your response? Will you be a good steward of God's grace and of God's resources? Will you respond to him? Because at the point where Abraham responded, then the ram was caught in the ticket. And the story, like you say, is history. Because God said, this is just a test. God provided for himself a lamb 
And then afterwards, God started to bless Abraham. And he swore over Abraham's destiny. And things never remained the same from that point. Final test. And Abraham passed. Will you pass the test of good stewardship this season? Will you pass the test as a kingdom trustee and not the owner of the things that God has given to you? I want you to lift your two hands to Jesus today and just ask him, Father, I receive grace to be a real trustee of your kingdom. I receive grace to be a steward of your manifold grace and your gift over my life. I am not the owner. I'm just a steward. All that I have, all that I am, and all that I will ever have, they all belong to you. They all belong to you. They all belong to you. That Let that be the confession of your mouth today as you lift your two hands to him, saying, Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated to you. I refuse to have the ownership mindset. I want to live my life with the stewardship mindset. I want to be a steward of everything that you have given to me. I want to position uh, for a, a great redistribution of wealth that, we're, that is happening right now and continue to happen as we go into the post-COVID era. I want you to find me faithful that you may bring more because the Bible says he that is faithful in little, more is added to him. I pray for everyone joined to this service today that God will find you faithful in little things. Find you faithful uh, with your small business. Find you faithful with the few opportunities that you have right now. Find you faithful with the resources that he's put in your hand. In the name of the Lord Jesus, may you qualify for what is ahead of us. In the name of Jesus, the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former. Uh, and I pray in the name of Jesus that God's glory will rest upon your life this season. God will find you faithful. God will find you qualified. In the name of the Lord Jesus, if there's anyone Listen to me right now. And you know that you have to repent. You know that you owe God. <laughs> I'm not trying to guilt trip anyone, but I, I just need you to know that when you have received a word like this, you need to search your heart. Not the hearers of the word that will be justified, but the doers. What am I going to do differently? How am I going to, uh, you know, somebody may need to go and listen to some of our old messages on stewardship. Get more messages on stewardship and ask yourself, uh, how am I going to build myself to become a real steward and not just the owner of the things that I have? Father, we thank you today. Wave your two hands to him and just bless him. Just bless him. Just bless him. Just bless him. Again, I decree, open heavens over everyone joined to this service today. I decree that uh, uh, everyone with little beginning, your latter end shall greatly increase. Everyone already enjoying increase. I declare in the name of Jesus that the increase will not stop that God will continue to find you faithful in the name of Jesus. And everyone who needs to repent this season and receive grace over your life to be able to repent and do something different. The Holy Spirit will give you permission to invade every life. Explain to each and every one this kingdom mystery in your own walls. Give greater revelation to everyone that is joined to this service to the end that no one will be found wanting as regards financial stewardship. Thank you, everlasting Father. We give you glory and we give you praise. In the precious name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you pray that prayer, you are born again. You are rededicated to God. And I want you to grow in this work of faith. If you made that decision today, I call on you to please let us know about it. Some information is displayed on the screen right now about what you can do about it. We want to know about that decision and we will be in touch with you to make sure you're growing and growing in this walk of faith. God bless you, child of God. See you soon. God bless. Thank you, PJ. Congratulations once again to everyone that has just said that prayer. Also, I have to say that I was really blessed by that message, and I believe that you must have been as well. I would like to encourage you to hear that again. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You can go back to our YouTube channel and watch that again. And kindly remember to subscribe. God bless you as you do so. Lastly, if you really enjoyed the sermon, drop a comment in the chat window like, I was blessed. You may also hit the thumbs up button on YouTube or Facebook. At this time, we would like to take our tithes and offering. And to do that, we send an interact transfer to 
info at elevatecommunitychurch.ca. Once again, that is info at elevatecommunitychurch.ca. As the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 10, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness in Jesus' name. As a registered charity, we will provide you gift receipts when the time is right for all your donations. God bless you as you send in your tithes and offerings. Now, let us welcome everyone joining our live stream for the very first time. Hey there! Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate, and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today, and we hope that you'll join us on our journey following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is the Elevate Community Church, the Canadian campus of the Elevation Church, Nigeria. We're on a mission to make greatness common. If you could subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Instagram and Facebook, we will appreciate it a lot. Here are the announcements for this week. A new set of maturity and spiritual development classes will start on Saturday, May 29th. Some of the available courses include Receiving the Baptism of the Holy Spirit Understanding the Ministry of the Holy Ghost Profiting by God's Word Believer's Lifestyle of Health and Healing Spiritual Leadership Essentials Mastering Your Emotions The Art of Worship All courses are free and will hold online. The classes will run for four weeks and each class starts at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The registration link is available on our social media platforms. Ladies in the House Elevate Jewels would like to invite you to an interesting and insightful time to study God's Word. The meeting will be holding on Saturday, May 22nd at 1 p.m. The discussions will center on how to embrace your God-given role by studying the life of Queens Esther and Vashti. Please plan to attend and to invite your friends. Singles in the house, this is for you. There will be a Netflix party on May 22nd, 2021, starting at 8 p.m. We will be watching the movie God Calling. Note that you need to register to receive the link to the party. The registration details is on our social media platforms. Our connect group meetings will hold this week. If you have an existing connect group, you can expect some information from your connect group leader. In case you need some information on how to join a connect group, send an email to connectgroups at elevatecommunitychurch.ca. We meet as a church family to pray on Wednesdays between 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. These prayer meetings are tagged with fresh prayers and the whole via Zoom. The link required to join can be found in the bio of our social media accounts. You will be refreshed as you join in Jesus' name. Elevate Kids meet bi-weekly on Saturdays via Zoom between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. The sessions break out into preschooler and elementary classes to ensure that children have a relatable experience. Kindly help your kids connect to these sessions. As different regions go back into lockdown, do let the church know how we can help or if you want to talk. You can send an email to contact 
at elevatecommunitychurch.ca or send a DM on any of our social media accounts at Elevate GTA. As we mentioned previously, our connect groups are also great for fellowship and prayers. Before we end the service today, kindly watch this short video. God, we're standing on this mountaintop. It has been a long climb. Behind us are the things we thought were so important. Twelve years of first days of school. Summer vacations. School dances and homecomings. Lunchroom food and locker rooms. Recesses and study halls. Grade after grade of report cards and parent-teacher conferences. Teachers and tutors and coaches. Science fairs and assemblies. Those twelve years behind us, down there at the bottom of this mountain. Now, Lord, we have climbed to the top. And we wait in the dark to see what happens next. There on the horizon, we know the moment. The light pierces the darkness. The glow, the rays of light and warmth. Radiating, illuminating, that is our future. We have climbed this high to see it. All those things we learned are the threads we have used to build these wings. We are not stepping off into an abyss, God. This is flight. This is soaring. We have come this far to launch. To ascend. To aspire. Now we hope in you, Lord. Don't let us grow tired. Renew our strength through you, and we'll soar on wings like eagles. We are prepared to fly into our future. Praise God, we would be closing the service from Psalms 91, verses 1 to 16. We like to personalize the scripture. It is displayed on the screen. Just follow along. Verse 1. I dwell in the secret place of the Most High, and I abide under the shadow of the Almighty. 2. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. 3. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. 4. He shall cover me with his feathers, and under his wings I shall take refuge. His truth shall be my shield and buckler. 5. I shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. 6. Nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. 7. A thousand may fall at my side, and ten thousand at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. 8. Only with eyes shall I look and see the reward of the wicked. 9. Because I have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, my dwelling place. 10. No evil shall befall me, nor shall any plague come near my dwelling. 11. For he shall give his angels charge over me, to keep me in all my ways. 12. In their hands they shall bear me up, lest I dash my foot against a stone. 13. I shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent I shall trample underfoot. 14. Because I have set my love upon him, therefore he will deliver me. He will set me on high, because I have known his name. 15. I shall call upon him, and he will answer me. He will be with me in trouble. He will deliver me and honor me. 16. With long life, he will satisfy me and show me his salvation. God bless you. Have a blessed week.